John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I fucking love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that post the next. Big job there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh, down goes Duffy out cold. Frank Mir does it again. Rock em, sock em, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bullshit artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, we are easy like Sunday morning. A good day to you. November 29, still 2020. (laughs) It's episode 278 of the Anakin Florian podcast. Ken Flo looking lean and mean, wearing a Grateful Dead (laughs) t-shirt. He is sober now. (laughs) How's it going there in uh, in one of the Carolinas? We're not going to divulge if it's North or South Carolina, but how's it going down there? (laughs) Doing good, dude. Uh, Man, we had quite the uh, combat sports weekend, eh? I mean... I say the show does itself. We've lost two UFC main events since we were last on the air. Aljamain Sterling and Piotr Jan is off since we were last on the air. We had Tyson and Roy Jones Jr. on pay-per-view last night. Probably some other headlines that I'm missing. But let's get into it, Ken Flo. It was UFC Fight Night Smith versus Clark instead of UFC Fight Night Blades versus Lewis because Curtis Blades tested positive for COVID-19. And there are a lot of these instances flow happening, and I've been on the wrong end of a false positive. I'm not saying that's what Curtis Blades was dealing with. But there have been a lot of these situations where fighters test clean all week, and then they go take that final test on Thursday or Friday. I guess for Blades, maybe this was his Wednesday test. But they take that final test, they go into quarantine, and then you wake up Saturday morning and you've lost your main event. I know we had a little bit more time than this for this one, but – Got a feel for Curtis Blades and the UFC losing a headliner about 48 hours out there, kid. Yeah, that, that's got to be tough uh, on, on, obviously, Blades and Lewis and the UFC. Um, you know, it, it was a fight I was looking forward to. Uh, you know, I think it was interesting. Anytime you get two heavyweights at the top of the division, uh, I think everybody kind of looks forward to it. It usually delivers as far as action. Uh, and in regards to these tests, yeah, you're seeing a lot of these uh, anomalies happen with these tests. Elon Musk, I think, tweeted uh, o- earlier in the week he, he took four tests. Two were positive. Two were negative. He's trying to figure out what the hell's going on. You know, yeah. these PCR tests, while they are quick and rapid and all that stuff, um, can uh, give some weird results. So, uh, you know, again, the, the COVID uh, weirdness continues. It, it's unfortunate, but uh, I, I do believe these guys will run it back sooner than later. And we're going to get to Tyson and Jones Jr. shortly. But in terms of Derek Lewis, there are two ways you can look at this. God damn it is one way to look at it because I just went through a training camp for Curtis Blade, stylistically probably the toughest matchup for me in the division. Or you can lean into the positive and say, those are really good training repetitions that I can parlay into a a next training camp. And if they make this fight happen, uh, you know, maybe I'm in an even better position to to deal with some of that resistance. But I think for the Black Beast, you finally get through the camp. You're right there. And for Curtis, too, got to be massively frustrating, I would think. Absolutely. I would add one other thing uh, into that equation, John, the fact that he does tend to suffer from a back injury uh, from time to time. And as a guy who has suffered from his fair share of uh, back injuries, um, sometimes those long training camps can take its toll, especially if you're having a heavy grappling type camp, like I'm sure he did have. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, for Derek Lewis, I I think, you know, if you're looking at the positive side, uh, I think, when you're dealing with something like grappling, it takes a lot more time to have that sensitivity, uh, you know, to deal with that wrestling style. Um, So I think it's an advantage for Derek Lewis to get more time, to get more repetitions uh, in. So um, it's unfortunate, um, but uh, I hope we see this, uh, you know, in at least a month or so. So Kevin Holland was supposed to face Jack Hermanson in the main event coming up this Saturday, December 5th. Now Kevin Holland is going to fight Jacare Souza on December 12th, a week later. So that's the Kevin Holland angle to all of this. I bring it up in this context because Blades and Lewis, in theory, could be turned around pretty quickly. I don't know if Blades is symptomatic or not, but everything is up in the air Everything is on the table. Marvin Vittori is stepping in to face Jack Hermanson. Anthony Smith and Devin Clark were elevated to the main event. Lionheart was all fired up to potentially go five rounds. And not unlike we had the weekend prior at UFC 255, Kemflo, we had another super quick main event. Two minutes and 34 seconds. And uh, 
Your winner by triangle choke in round one, Anthony Lionheart Smith. Your thoughts? Listen, I thought this was a completely different Anthony Smith just from uh, the start of the fight. Before any strikes were thrown, this seemed like a way more focused and determined Anthony Smith. So I thought that was a good sign. He got off to a great start, hit a beautiful takedown over the wrestler Devin Clark with the excellent body lock takedown. Uh, had good position. Devin was able to reverse the situation, get on top, uh, but that only allowed uh, Anthony Smith to play a very tight close guard, something you don't really see at a high level done well. Anthony Smith did an excellent job of controlling the posture uh, of Devin Clark, uh, fed that wrist, very, you know, kind of similarly to how uh, Anderson Silva fed it against Chael Sonnen. Uh, kept his head down so Devin really wasn't able to posture out of it and explode out of it, Uh, locked in that triangle choke with those long legs, got the angle, got that deep bite on the neck, and it was all over for Devin Clark. Anthony Smith looked uh, just really sharp, Um, even just mentally and the way he approached it. He just looked different, John, and we were talking about this uh, and how he kind of lost that in his last couple fights. I think he's back. I'm glad to hear you talk in simple terms and say things like he had that look back in his eye, you know, because when I say that, people say, oh, what does that even mean, right? But when Ken Flo says mentally he had that look back in his eye, I think it really does mean something. And one of our listeners, Josh Penland, wrote to me privately in speaking to the podcast last week. He said, your point of view on Smith uh, that you brought up scared the shit out of me because he had a Smith bet, but he had already gotten it in at minus 110, so he had to let it ride. And then he said one of the good guys got back on track. But the point of view that he's referencing when I talked about Anthony Smith potentially still having some post-traumatic stress from that break-in, and he has acknowledged as much maybe without using those words. But I think anything that he had to prove mentally, even if you'll say it's hard to prove it in two and a half minutes, I just think the walk, the way he carried himself during fight week, when this fight got elevated to a main event, I felt like it was a very good thing for Lionheart. You know, grab the bulls by the horns, so to speak, or grab the whatever the expression is, go get it. And he certainly went and got it. And I'm very happy for him because he's been through a whole hell of a lot. And uh, as he said, post fight, you know, he's not in the business of putting on stinkers. You know, he's been known as a finisher. He's been known for exciting fights. And when you're finishing Alexander Gustafson and then two years later, you find yourself where he found himself. You just got to feel good for a train being back in the wind column. You know, there's a multitude of factors, uh, both leading to a fight and uh, to the fight itself. And I think people forget about. Uh, the personal or life experience that goes with each camp of all the different things that life can throw your way, Uh, whether it's a dude trying to break into your house uh, or, you know, a death in a family or whatever it is, those things can throw you off mentally, physically, spiritually. You can have a little injury that lingers, Um, you know, you know, some training partners that weren't available for a specific fight, uh, a style of fighter that can throw you off. So, Managing that whole process as a fighter, as a coach, you know, for each training camp uh, is very difficult to do. Um, And sometimes you get it right. Sometimes you get it wrong. You get thrown off mentally. You get thrown off technically. Um, So I I think whatever happened, it seems like Anthony Smith has it dialed in uh, or did anyway for this fight against Devin Clark. He looked way sharper. This was such an important fight for him. He got the win. But imagine what would have happened to him in his career if he got the loss. This is how brutal professional sports are. This is how brutal combat sports is. He could have been, you know, facing a cut here. So the fact that he was able to get this win is huge for him. And the fact that he's able to do it uh, in tremendous fashion with a finish against a tough opponent in the first round, uh, I I think really looked good for him. So great, great to see a great guy like Anthony Smith get this win. And he's been used at times by the UFC as an analyst, right? So you don't want to start losing four or five fights in a row, get cut potentially, and the TV stuff is in jeopardy. So certainly feel good for Anthony Lionheart Smith. Now, Devin Clark at times has been a slow starter, didn't start all that well against Alonzo Menafield, if memory serves, and then really took over that fight. He was dealing with the death in the family, as they mentioned on broadcast. I think it was his mother-in-law that passed away about a week before the fight. So who knows what type of headspace Devin Clark was in and how he dealt with the elevation to the main event. But Kenny, what would you say to the buddy who texts me like, God damn, I had Devin Clark at plus money. Like, doesn't he know that Anthony Smith is dangerous and long off of his back? Like, what would you say to the Clark backers? You know, you and Ian Parker both thought he would win, uh, who felt shortchanged by this performance. 
I, I will say this, you know, a lot of it had to do with the inconsistency of Anthony Smith. Did Anthony Smith have the ability to win this fight? 100%. But all we can go on is what we've seen and what right. we've seen recently, right? So it was an Anthony Smith that didn't seem like he was focused. It seemed like he wasn't in the best headspace. He was making poor decisions during the fight. Uh, didn't have that same kind of fighting spirit that we saw, say, in uh, the fight against John Jones. Uh, predicting fights, uh, you know, and gambling on fights, all this is very, very difficult thing to do. Um, There are so many factors that can go right or wrong. I thought Devin Clark, um, you know, maybe made a poor decision in keeping his head down too, you know, too much and and allowing Anthony Smith to control that. I think, um, you know, maybe had a, a second or two to adjust and maybe get out of it. He did it. This is the fight yeah. game. And uh, again, you, you got to give props to Anthony Smith for doing all the right things when he needed to. And if you do want a deeper dive on the jujitsu stuff, Ken Flo's YouTube page uh, continues to be populated with videos. Thank if you want you. some of the more technical stuff. Well, hey, man, we just ain't going to go too deep here because uh, I want to get to Caramel Thunder before we get to Mike Tyson and Roy Jones Jr. I would sit here and say. And by the way, we're talking about Miguel Baeza, co-main event winner over Takashi Sato by arm triangle choke in round two. Undefeated fighter out of MMA Masters here in South Florida. I would sit here and say I would get a Caramel Thunder if this guy becomes the welterweight champion. But I'm afraid he might. So I'm not going to put that tattoo bet on the line right now. This dude is a real problem, as you articulated on social media over the weekend. And uh, I don't know what the ceiling is, but it's pretty darn high for Miguel Baeza. What would you think of the co-main? I tell you what, he's a smooth operator. I think Sato... Um, you know, basically didn't look very good because of how good Baeza fought last night. Sato is a very dangerous fighter. He's got knockout power. He's not an easy guy to take down necessarily. He may have his weakness on the ground, but I tell you what, on the feet, he could strike with pretty much anyone in the welterweight division. Baeza just never allowed for that to happen. The great fighters can make another fighter, another good fighter, look like he's not a problem at all. And Baeza just completely shut him down. I don't know if Baeza really got hit with anything major. It was clean. Uh, his decision-making was excellent. He kept him on the outside. Uh, and then when he, once he got him to the ground, we said that was going to be a big problem. Baeza is someone to watch. I'm telling you, keep an eye on this kid. He's confident. He's still undefeated. Uh, but he made the right decisions, and uh, he, he's a kid that really could go very far. Looked excellent everywhere. Big fight coming up next for Miguel Baeza, and we congratulate all the winners. Parker Porter, the heavyweight out of New England, getting his first UFC win. Gina Bazzani looks outstanding, having since aligned with James Krause. So uh, a big night for the UFC. Big night for boxing as well. So I bought the pay-per-view, forty nine ninety nine. I bought it in some part because I wanted to see how Israel Adesanya did on commentary, and, and the early returns are quite good. Because I know him well, I noticed a touch of nerves in only his first utterance, and then I thought he crushed it the rest of the way. But I have to say, right, as someone who has bought hundreds of boxing and UFC pay-per-views over the years, first I'll say it was nice to see a number four on the front of that, not 59.99 or 69.99 or Floyd Mayweather 94.99. But I'm about to call my 50th straight pay-per-view, so I haven't bought a UFC pay-per-view in a while. I remember a time when I hosted the Mouthpiece Boxing Show and I would write off my pay-per-views. But I remember a time like where I would beg my girlfriend to let me order the boxing pay-per-view. And we couldn't afford it, you know, and somehow, some way we would uh, figure out a way to split it, you know, 25 bucks a piece or whatever it was back (laughs) in the day. But it's kind of nice to, as you get older, to be like, hey, man, I can afford this pay-per-view tonight. And uh, I don't have to ask my wife to buy it either. (laughs) Exactly. You don't need to ask for permission. Um, Yeah, listen, I I thought it's always cool, right? Anytime you're able to see. Uh, the legends go at it again. I think it brings a certain nostalgia to the event, right? And, uh, you know, there was a, uh, I can't think of many more powerful forces than Mike Tyson in the 80s and 90s. I mean, the guy was just uh, unbelievable. And and anytime he fought, whether uh, he was undefeated or not, people wanted to see it because he brings a certain energy uh, and a mystique that is unlike many other fighters. And I think... um, it was cool to see uh, two giants of boxing go at it, and again, it was a little bit later in the fu- later uh, in their lives. 
I actually was really impressed with both of their takes and how they were fighting. It was, you know, we saw some unusual uh, approaches from Roy Jones, which I thought was really cool. Actually, a similar footwork pattern to what Dominic Cruz uses, which I thought was really interesting and neat. He was yeah. clinching at the right time because you just don't want to take many headshots yeah. against someone like Mike right. Tyson. And Tyson, I thought, was nice enough. If you call, if you want to call this nice enough, to go to the body and not use those left and right hooks to the head, because I was really afraid for Roy Jones uh, if he was going to do that. So it seemed like it was a uh, thing that uh, Tyson was purposely doing. He could have certainly gone upstairs. He, yeah. he chose to go downstairs, I think, for a reason. Uh, but overall, I thought we saw a Tyson that was moving his head, was looking sharp. And again, it's just it, it was cool. I have to admit, I really wasn't so excited about it. But having watched it, it was cool to see them go out there and really not look too bad. I mean, these right. guys are in their 50s, man. I, I was really impressed. Yeah, we've seen some bad MMA over the years. This was not bad boxing, per se. And one guy's 54 years old. The other is 51. A lot of underhooking going on. In a lot a of clinches. Realm. A, a lot, lot of, of clinch situations. Yeah. Two minute rounds. That that clock just rips. But uh, yeah. want to be largely positive today. But I do want to get to a little uh, tweet thread on uh, <laughs> at Kenny Florian that I thought was pretty funny. But I do have more thoughts on the fight on the back end of this. So Ken Flo in tweeting uh, over the weekend. Combat sports is obviously different than other sports. But I'm curious if people would be genuinely interested in seeing other professional sports feature non-pros and or athletes that are past their prime? Like, would people be interested in seeing the 1986 Celtics and Lakers teams go at it in 2020? I've, Yvonne Lendl, or is it Ivan Lendl? See how old I'm getting? Yeah, I mean, Yvonne, I Yvonne Lendl, guy. you got Yvonne it. Yvonne Lendl versus Boris Becker in 2020. Why is this common in combat sports? Is it nostalgia? And somebody wrote back to you, uh, Nick Palmasano. Yeah. I'd watch the Celts Lakers from the 80s in a heartbeat, to which Ken Flo replied, just to make sure we're saying the same thing. You would want to watch 63 year old today. So it seems like we are talking about this in combat sports a lot more than those other sports. I will say as much as I love Larry Joe Bird, I don't need to see him in a three on three setting right now in 2020 necessarily. That's my take. I mean, that's my take. Listen, I, I don't want to, you know, if you're talking about art or, uh, ath you know, athletes or whatever, I want to see their best work, man. I don't need to see, uh, even if it's like, you know, 20% less of what right, they used to do. Right. Why? I already right. saw them at their right. best. Why do I need to, you know what I mean? Okay, cool. It makes you feel cool because it was something that, you know, you bring up yeah. memories and all that stuff. Hey, just go back, find, the, find it on YouTube and watch that 86 game again. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, I just, I want to see an athlete's best work and we already yeah. saw it. Why do we need to do this again? Why? I don't well, know. Well, when I get tweets like, man, Anik, I used to hate you and uh, you're getting better. And it's like, sometimes I'll write back. Well, it's like, I'm not trying to get worse. And as soon as I start right. getting worse, people in my life that will tell me and I will go away. I promise you I'll go away uh, before I lose my fastball as far as this job is concerned. And uh, yeah, I think too often in any walk of life, we see people stick around. I mean, with respect, and, and Bruce Buffer's going to kill me, right? But I'm trying to be honest to my audience here, like Michael Buffer last night. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I never was like the biggest fan of his compared to Bruce because Bruce just brings this energy and this dynamic to a live event that uh, that I don't think Michael brings. Yeah. Michael Buffer was pretty good with certain utterances. Certainly for me as an announcer and a commentator, I'm studying everything out of the guy's mouth. And, uh, you know, give me prime Michael Buffer as opposed to the version we saw last night. But uh, got to give a lot of respect to Mike Tyson and Roy Jones Jr. It's really interesting watching Roy Jones Jr. when you've watched him in his prime to right. watch him try to work the footwork game and uh, without that patented speed. But uh, I don't know. I thought Izzy was great on commentary. Good to see Mauro Ronaldo back on the sticks. Uh, Jake Paul and Nate Robinson in the co-main event can flow. So kicking myself for not betting Jake Paul by knockout. But I bring this fight up not so much in the context of what Jake Paul can do as a pro boxer. I'm excited for that to see how far he can take it. Um, but man, Nate Robinson, you know, are you okay to keep fighting son? You want to keep fighting? Of course he does, you know, come get another concussion. And this is oh. why boxers die more than MMA fighters. This is how it happens. Uh, you couldn't be more uh, right about that. And, and it was concerning again, you know, it's never a good thing, man, when you get knocked out and you're sleeping, that, that's just not your, your brain has shut down. It said, I've had enough. There's an overload, okay? And uh, it, it's it's a very dangerous thing that could absolutely kill you. And, and that's why striking is so dangerous, pure striking. And I think the even the bigger boxing gloves, 
I think make it even more dangerous. Uh, it's a larger punching surface. I can punch a hell of a lot harder than I can even with the four ounce glove, in my opinion. Uh, I think the energy is dispersed over a, lo- uh, a, a larger surface. But anyways, it was tough to see that, man. Um, Jake Paul, first of all, I thought it was a pretty good knockout, man. For a guy who doesn't really, who hasn't done that for many years, yeah, man. I thought it was a pretty slick knockout. And unfortunately for uh, Nate Robinson, I mean, he ran right into it, which makes it that much more devastating. He was already hurt. He was concussed before that, as you mentioned. And then seeing to, go, to see him go to sleep after that like that uh, was hard to watch, man. Face first down on the canvas is never a good thing. When you are face first down in MMA... You're, you've lost 99.9% right. of the time that fight is over. What? Right. <laughs> Maybe there's the rare instance where a guy comes to super quick and is able to turn onto his back. But face first in boxing, you get 10 seconds to stand up and come get another concussion. And that's exactly what happened yes. to Nate Robinson and some scary visuals at the end of that. And, uh, hey, man, I covered a boxing death in 2005. So I, 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 I've seen it. I know how it happens. And uh, multiple concussions in one fight uh, is just never a good thing. But uh, good effort over the weekend. I enjoyed watching the pay-per-view. That's pretty much all I have on the boxing front, Ken Flo. And uh, Ray Longo, I'm told, is waiting in the wings. But we all know 2020 has been a little bit nuts. That being said, it does not mean you should disregard taking care of yours. You know what I'm talking about. Manscaped is on a mission to take care of your manhood with their below-the-waist grooming and hygiene products. The mission has now gone international as well. we got a lot of international viewers and listeners, and Manscaped has now released their products in the UK, Canada, and Australia as well. Manscaped has changed the way I go about my hygiene, not using that same trimmer on my face and my head as I use down there because I got my lawnmower 3.0 waterproof technology on this thing as well. You can bring it in the shower and Manscaped does not stop at the lawnmower 3.0. They've just released the crop care kit as well, includes all sorts of products, ball wipes, foot deodorant, body wash in that bundle as well. They've got a weed whacker for your nose hair and your ears. And these formulations for every Manscaped product, all vegan, cruelty-free, dye-free, sulfate-free, and paraben-free, so you know you're in good hands. And if you are not there yet, now is the time to get in on the Manscaped craze. Get 20% off and free shipping right now at manscaped.com slash AF. No promo code required. Just go to manscaped.com slash AF for 20% off and free shipping. Manscaped.com slash AF. All right, let's get to the Ray Longo Minute. Now time for the Ray Longo Minute. I want you to punch a hole in this fucking chest. That's what I want. The Ray Longo Minute. Starring Ray Longo. The John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. The star of the show on a Sunday morning. Does it look like cold brew today, Ray? Is that just a regular cup of coffee? Uh, this is some uh, herbal tea. Herbal That's tea, it. okay. So look at the look at the cup, man. Can you Led see Led Zeppelin? A Led Zeppelin going on, baby. I like Can you it. hold that up a little bit higher? The camera's up there. You go, Raymond. Look at there that. you go, RP. I'm so saying, uh it's better coming out of a Led Zeppelin mug. Remember that. <laughs> so a busy Bro. combat sports evening. I, I still hear the morning in your voice a little bit. So you stayed yeah. up and watched the uh, Mike Tyson Roy Jones Jr. pay per view and, and the UFC card last night. Oh, I was uh, flipping back and forth, flipping back and forth. So uh, where would you flipping like to start? And, oh, Actually, sorry. I know exactly where we're going to start. We got you. You're the, you know, you're the, you're the moderator. It's All me right, and so Kenny. I'm going to level with our Kenny, Joe here. Biden, I'm Trump. Just, <laughs> if, uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's going to be this type of morning because I'm completely out of my motherfucking mind today. <laughs> Well, I want to always be as transparent as possible with our listeners. And I would say if I got married next weekend, Ray Longo would probably be in the wedding party. He would probably be a groomsman. So I don't know that I could pay him a greater compliment in terms of him and my personal life as I could do that. That being said, I had to crack a mic on this podcast last week, knowing that Al Jermaine Sterling and Piotr Jan wasn't uh-huh. happening. And I and you know this now because we've spoken off the air and I had to keep that from you. And uh, it kind of is what it is. But there were rumblings. Now the fight's off. Um, Aljo seems to be handling it a lot better than you and me. <laughs> I, th- I would say he is handling it way better than me and you. I Man, I had my trip. I was leaving tomorrow. Right. Uh, and and Marab's fight also, man, which, I, you know, they left him, you know, when they did the uh, preview, they left him on right. the card to be announced. But he's 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 out also, man. It's uh 
I went from a very exciting uh, December to uh, just blah, is all I could say. So Marab was going to fight Haoni Barcelos, but that fight uh, did not get cleared on the Barcelos end. So Marab is now off the card completely because I'm looking at a fight card right now. It says Marab Dwalashwili versus TBD, but you're telling me he's probably not competing at this point. Well, I don't think, no, he's not competing at this point. Right. It's fight week, I guess, tomorrow. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, well, that's a blow. Do you have a date on Aljo? No. I mean, you think in February or March, or are you just kind of I- idling right now and presuming it's going to be Jan again? I'm, uh, well, definitely presuming it's going to be Jan again for sure. Yeah. I don't think, uh, I think that's a given, but I'm, I right. think it's either, I think they're looking at February 13th or February 23rd or 20th. Or, but I All think right. the, the 13th, I think, was, uh, was what I heard, but I could I could be confused that because I think Weidman's fighting on the 13th. So we got to get to that as it's, well. Yeah, it's Jan and Poppin. Well, listen, uh, what about this boxing match, man? Um, you know, <clears throat> did you see it? Did you enjoy it? And why did you get it? Because that, that's what I'm curious. John and I were just talking about it. Is it nostalgia? Is it because you, you genuinely want to see the fight? Uh, and and what do you think? No, I'm going to go 100 percent nostalgia. Uh, you know, it wasn't something, uh, it was really just nostalgia. I wanted to see, uh, you know, hon- honestly, Kenny, even being an older guy, see what these guys look like at 55, 51, whatever. So it was more, more like that. You know, I wasn't expecting a high level boxing match. Uh, sure. but I think, you know, interesting Kenny is, uh, just going back to some of the old adages, that speed is the first thing to go. Power is the last to go. I think we saw that last night. Yeah, I agree. Louis Jones looked like he was in slow motion. And that was a guy that maybe was the fastest, had the fastest hands ever in boxing. You know what I mean? So yes. see that, whereas Tyson still had power. Yep. You know what I mean? So it, it, I thought based on that, it, it was an interesting take to me. I go, wow, speed really did. That was the first to go, and 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 Tyson still holds some power. I mean, I'm going to say, you know, that guy cracks you in your head out on the street. The average guy is going to sleep for a long time. You know what I mean? So uh, I thought Tyson looked good. You know, Roy Jones, I think, tried to, you know, he had a couple of tricks and tried to, I guess, wear him out and hold. And, you know, I thought the ref did a, a horrible job on just letting him stay in the clinch too long. He yeah. could have made that fight way more exciting for a two minute round. To each oh, yeah. It was, it was actually awful, but uh, who knows? He might've had safety in the back of his mind and let's just get through this with nobody getting hurt type of mentality. But uh, yeah, that was the first thing that, that, that I, I, I thought was interesting was the speed versus power, uh, you know, uh, things that we always hear. And I think it, we saw it last night, man. It's so funny. I hate to sort of have a curmudgeonly take on boxing, but every time I watch boxing in an extended way, Ray, it just reminds me why I love mixed martial arts so much when they clinch. It's like, I want them to work themselves out. You know, uh, that was horrible. Last. That part was really, really horrible. But look, Last night, it wasn't, you know, was it a buy? It was entertainment. I mean, from right, everything, right. you know, I thought it was an interesting look. I think uh, the other thing, Kenny and John, I think they tried to grab every possible demographic they could grab for this thing. They had, I thought Israel Adesanya being on on the broadcast booth was, was crazy. You know what I mean? So they got his, I'm sure he's got a lot of followers, Sugar Ray Leonard you know, Snoop Dogg, you know, so they had three different, told, right. three totally different people in there right. that could bring a lot of eyeballs to that, right? If you just want to hear Izzy comment, I mean, I don't know. I yeah. mean, that's, that's a big thing. Maybe MMA guys tuned in just for that. And then obviously all the, the entertainment in between, and then they bring in Logan Paul, who's got a huge YouTube following. Think about it. I'm sure yeah. they, they, I'm sure they hit it out of the park last night, just based yeah. on everybody having you know, 10 million followers and stuff like they that. They didn't have Led Zeppelin in there, though. Yeah, why not, didn't they not, have not, Led Zeppelin? I don't know if they would have paid right. Zeppelin. I mean, that's why I say I think uh, it was just, it was funny, though, man. It was, I, th- I thought it was, uh, I didn't watch the whole thing. I just waited. I, th- I think I saw the Logan Paul fight. The, only, the Logan Paul fight Jake, and uh, Jake fight Paul. With, uh, Jake Paul. Oh, is that Jake Paul, right? Yeah, it's Jake. Brother. I think it was yeah. Jake. Oh. I think it was Jake. Oh, right, right. Um, is he as big of a, 
internet guy is his brother. That's for you to, I mean, that's your world, TikTok. Um, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. I don't even know. Yeah, I have no idea. Okay, right. so, I, so basically, I was just talking. I I just proved I had no idea. I, I didn't even know he had a brother. So, <laughs> so Well, I watched the pay-per-view this morning because I go to bed at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and I was hoping that my daughters could enjoy some of the musical acts. And uh, you know I like a good blunt like anybody out there, but – Every word was motherfuck this, motherfuck that. Everybody yeah, smoking man. blunts, and it wasn't very conducive to uh, to that seven to nine year old girl demographic. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think Sugar Ray Leonard wanted to crawl out of there. I really, <laughs> yeah, I, didn't I look really cool. believe Leonard was in a state of shock. <laughs> I'm not even joking. And then Snoop oh. Dogg is just, I mean, the guy is completely insane. But he was funny. When he, what did he say about? Oh, the basketball play. He brought his bat. I mean, did you watch it or no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he brought his basketball shoes. He didn't bring his boxing shoes. He is funny, man. How so. about Jake Paul coming out to Curtis Blow's basketball, Ken Flo? I don't know if you noticed that, but I thought that was uh, gangster right there. Yeah. yeah. And I think they picked a good night because I thought out of all the UFC cards, this was one of the weaker ones that, you know, I think between the all the COVID, uh, you know, uh, test that came back positive, screwing up the card. I thought they picked a a great night because that was I thought that was a pretty weak card. So I think uh, timing worked out good for those guys. Yeah, I don't know what Thanksgiving weekend says about ratings. I know the UFC has been live and not dark most often on those Thanksgiving weekends over the last several years. We've been in China most of the time and not stateside, but uh, wow. interesting stuff. Regardless, uh, we also talked about that Jake Paul knockout from a Nate Robinson standpoint, right? The former New York Nick and Boston Celtic, right? Getting a couple concussions. And uh, I know the drum that they kept beating on the broadcast, Ray, was um, was that you can't play fighting. You can't play boxing. And uh, defensively, I mean, Nate Robinson left a lot to be desired. Jake Paul was raising the guard. He was moving his head. Nate Robinson was uh, an easy target to hit. And man, did he get touched. Yeah, man, he, he, as the saying goes, he went down like a sack of shit. But, uh, is that is that how you guys say it? We don't say yeah. that in Boston. Is that what you guys say? Yeah, you say yeah. sack of potatoes, I think. You say sack of shit, New York, huh? Yeah, sack of shit. Folded like know. a lawn chair, folded yeah. like fresh laundry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so before we let you go, I want to get to Weidman and Uriah Hall in the rematch. And I also want to get your thoughts on Anthony Smith and Devin Clark in uh, in what was a quick main event. Um, let us start with Chris Weidman and Uriah Hall running it back. I know the buzzword for Weidman is always health. I know he was back in New York there briefly, but he seems genuinely appetized and enthused and excited about a fight that I didn't think was going to come around again for you guys. I I never thought that fight was going to happen. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, when he called me with it, I was like, yeah, I don't know. What do you want to give this guy a shot to get back, you know, at I don't know. It did seem weird. But then when I looked at, you know, they're both 36. I like the age matchup. I think it's a, it's a, it's a good matchup for Chris again. He's he's confident because he already beat him. Uh, I think Uriah has been active though, uh, but you know, according to Dana White, he's very inactive during the round. So, right. uh, it, it, look, I, I had a great time with Weidman. We we uh, we went out, got a little drunk together. Uh, yeah, yeah, How about that? a couple of drinks. Yeah, yeah, it was funny. Well, yeah. a couple of pictures, but. Uh, uh, yeah, he see he's in a good spot, man. He he's he's definitely healthy, and uh, you know he's dying to go. So we'll see what happens. So I know it's your personal business. I also know that the COVID nineteen numbers are much better in New York than they are here in Florida. But you going out to watering holes now? I mean, are we uh are we going are we Pat Milicic in this thing now? What are we doing? I tell you, man. I'm <laughs> just kidding. No, 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 no. You don't have to be kidding. kidding because I tell you that was why one of the reasons I didn't put up the picture because when. You know, we took a picture with the whole restaurant. We kind of closed the place. The dirty oh. taco. Let me let me give it a. The dirty taco was really what a phenomenal place. How about right that? next right next to the rusty trombone. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so so you guys just shut down the whole place. You're like the we mafia. Shut, I mean, you do. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Want. We shut shut down the whole yeah. place. Right. And uh, but yeah, it was it was good. They had plexiglass up. Everybody had a mask on. Uh, so I thought it was, uh, was, was safe to go, but you know, when you start drinking, the mask comes off real easy. I think that's why you don't want people drinking. Well, and I think you're a little bit of a lightweight because you oh, don't drink alcohol. Oh, I'm going to tell you some two drinks 
yeah. more and I get carried out of there. That's how bad it was. I had a, what did I have? This guy, the bartender was making us cojitos. Oh man, delicious, man. What a. Okay. So our young 1993 born producer, Cody Mero yeah. is nodding when he hears, I've heard of a mojito. I have not heard of a cojito, Cody. What is that? Oh, Cody. Well, I think the term you're looking for is coquito, which is a sorry, man. You know, look at the millennials. Cody, thank you very much because I've been doing this the whole weekend because we have a kid in the gym, Joey Cologne, who makes coquitos and he bottles it up and he sells it and it's it's awesome. And the guy at the Dirty Taco, Raphael, the bartender, phenomenal. It was his grandmother's recipe. John passed. He couldn't even tell us. He was shaking. He didn't, you know. He couldn't tell us the ingredients. He can only give us like three out of the six. So uh, wow. very exciting times back here in New York. Raphael or Joey Cologne listen to the uh, no, podcast they, they, by chance? No idea. I don't know. Uh, we'll All find right. out. Joey probably does. He's a he's a stud fighter out of the gym, so I'm sure he might listen to it. So when you get drinking these Coquitos or whatever they're called, do you start telling people about your TV show Extra Rounds or do you drive them to the podcast? <laughs> Everything is AF with me. All right, just, it's, all either right. FU, it's either FU or AF. One of the other. <laughs> That's good. I like that. All yeah. right. Do you have anything for me on Anthony Smith and Devin Clark? I think we're all happy for Lionheart, given everything that he has been through. I, I was disappointed for Devin Clark, first UFC main event, and it was kind of over before it started. You have anything uh, for us on the UFC main event before we let you go? I think that was a there was a big gap in experience, and I, I again Anthony Smith. If you know him, I only know him a little bit, but I uh, but it seems like just a super super nice guy, intelligent. Like him when he's on the broadcast booth too with you guys. Sometimes when they put him on, yeah. Uh, I just think it was you know, look the guy's fought the best of the best. He's fought everybody. Uh, that was a big step up for Devin Clark, and uh, I think it showed. Well put. All right, my man. Well, we will let you get back. To your That's Sunday, done. I so so now I'm leaving for Vegas in a few days. I'm going to be there for 11 nights, and you're not going to be there at all. And I was looking forward to hanging with you, man. I know yes. I wasn't going to go to bars all over Vegas like you guys no, are no, doing no, right no. now. That, but, that you was know. a woman and done. That was uh, I mean, I haven't. I know. I've just. I haven't I'm seen just... been months, man. That was. Uh, I don't even know. That was stupid. How's that? No, Protect I'm not, yourself. Hey. Pre- Ray, yeah, protect no, yourself it's, it's, anytime you enter the dirty taco, okay? Yeah, yeah, listen, <laughs> yeah. listen, listen, listen here's, the, here, here's the problem. Like, when this thing first went around, right, I didn't know. Like, I knew, you know, we knew the one guy that died, obviously, the photographer, and I had a couple other people. Uh, so I don't I don't know people that are dying, but I'm telling you, John, this, I got to know 200 people that have tested positive. Uh, the first go around, like, it was like, man, it's weird. Nobody I know yeah. You know, really test now it's, it's spreading like wildfire. So I don't. Oh, it's nothing to mess with. That's for sure. I mean, I have a different, uh, risk tolerance level than my identical twin brother who lives 2.5 miles away from here. I sent my kids back to school sooner. I went to Dick sporting goods with my kids yesterday in Florida, which some people think is crazy. My two year old son was wearing a mask and, uh, kind of is what it is. But the spectrum, I think, is what yeah. surprises me that you can have people who have absolutely no respect for the virus and won't wear a mask or, or do anything to allegedly protect other people. Uh, and then you have other people that are afraid to leave their homes. And I think those people yeah. that are so fearful should stay home. Yeah, you know? yeah. which kind of stinks, though, because, uh, yeah, it, it's. Yeah. You know, I feel bad for those people that aren't uh, leaving their houses, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I, I just here's my my problem is I just hope one day they can leave like before this thing started. And I'm not sure that's going to happen. I think there's a lot of PTSD that's going to be, you know, embedded in some people that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, which just isn't good. But, you know, I had a conversation with Chris. He's home. He, he's at the point now. He's like, man, I hope. And he. A lot of people he knows have gotten it. You know, we we talked about that. But uh, he's at the point now, he just feels like getting it now if he's going to get it so he can get it over with and be, his fight doesn't get canceled. You know, well, it's like, but you just don't know what type of long term ramifications there might be. You don't know how your body is going to react individually when you get it. And the yeah. one thing I'll say too, right, if for yeah. those out there that would mask shame or be upset when we have a post on Anik Florian Pod on social media that, you know, says we're selling Ray Longo minute masks. 
my younger brother is 39 years old and essentially hasn't left his apartment since February because he had open heart surgery and he was fine. So excited to be done with the surgery. But I do think some post-traumatic stress has crept in. And I feel like the longer he stays home and he listens to this show, longer he stays home, the harder it is going to be to rip off the Band-Aid. Um, but again, he's high risk and Cody, he's staying home. And then, John, look at look at Cody Garbrandt still suffering. Right. right. Uh, you know, the, I think the younger guys, I have a kid in the gym, Dennis uh, Bazooka. He fought on the contender series yep. still to this day. His lungs are, are bothering him. And he's a young kid. And he had it back in February before we even knew. See, there you go. Yeah. yeah it, it, so for the younger guys, the guys in their 20s, uh, they're getting hammered, man. I think that's the long term effect. Some of the I think the older you are. Or you're in a certain age group, uh, you, you kind of lose your, your sense of smell and taste, and it seems like that's it. You know, a little little fever here and there, but it's over pretty quick. And then there's the people that I don't know. Well, like you say, what's going to be the long term effects? Yeah. You know, and 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 I just seeing Cody's story, I think is scary. I mean, and it still doesn't seem to be putting the fear of God in a lot of people. But right. when right. you think of it like that, man, it's pretty scary. So. I got to regroup and definitely get a little more, you know, uh, diligent in what I'm doing because I'm starting to slip a little bit. Cody Marrow, did you have something or no? I just wanted to bring up the point that Ray had about uh, Garbrandt because he's a young guy. I think he's, you know, 27, 28. He's around my age. And that's not something that I'm concerned about. I'm going outside running all the time. You know, it's the long term impacts is really what you don't think about. And I think you're starting to see that, too, with the NCAA and a lot of their cancellations. Right. Yeah, look, man, it hits everybody different. That's what makes this this coronavirus crazy. Yeah, everybody gets hit different. Who you know who gets it is different. Uh, how you react to it is different. And you know, you always hear in those stories that uh, you know uh, my brother got it, and nobody else in the house uh, got it. And you know, I'm, I, you know, my my point almost is I think some of the testing is off. I'm, you know, my brother got it. He didn't have any symptoms, and nobody else got it. Yeah, because he didn't have it. I think. I think the test was wrong. You know what I mean? I that. The other problem, I don't know how reliable the results are. When you hear some of these stories, a guy takes six tests, three are positive, three are negative. Who the hell knows? But yeah. I think the people that have gotten it, that had a rough time with it, that are, you know, even 30, 35, 40, you talk to them and they're like, dude, it's not a joke. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. you got this. So I don't know. We're in a weird time, man. Let's get the it vaccine. It's been a weird year. I'll take that vaccine as soon as I can get my hands on it. And on a lighter note, if you are a barber or hairstylist in the greater New York area near Longo Weidman MMA, and you would like to cut Ray's hair live on the podcast any Sunday morning, Uh let us know at Anik Florian pod. Cody Merrill will set it up behind the scenes. We're going to do a haircut live on the air. You said you were getting sick of it. You know, I think we need to just rein this in a little bit, Ray. What do you think? I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to put that. I have, there's people that are going to take you up on that offer. Outstanding. We'll I have, make them uh, famous. We'll make them famous. I'm going to have two girls cut it at the same time. How's that? Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> As, you the locks that are with your not wife for sale, good? people. Oh, is that? Am the I locks that are not for sale. And daughters, or are, are you okay doing the, the threesome with the haircut next week on the podcast? I'm going to do the threesome All with right. the haircut. No All question right. about it. All right. Uh, <laughs> love you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> Well, my list wasn't that long this week. We look forward to Aljo and Jan getting rebooked. The only the only reason I suggested otherwise is because Aljo was barking about an interim title, which I don't think makes any sense. But no, they'll make that fight in a couple months. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here in mid-February, so we'll see what happens. All right. Good stuff, my man. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. NFL starts at 1 Eastern if you want to end that boycott. All right. Uh, yeah, I won't be doing that. But uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, all right, buddy. We'll talk to you next fun. Sunday. Take it easy, guys. Yeah, Ray. And don't forget, if you are a barber in the New York area and you would like to cut Ray's hair live on the Anakin Florin podcast next Sunday around 1130 a.m. Eastern, we would love to have you. All right. We have a pronunciation of the week for you this week. And this is a Russian featherweight who is charged with kicking off the main card this weekend in Vegas. He will take on Nate Landwehr. This guy's good, Ken Flo. He's 13-0 and overall, 3-0 and in the UFC, Greco-Roman wrestler, outstanding finisher, and a 5-1 to one favorite against Nate Landwehr this weekend. That's actually why we're not picking the fight in the main event challenge. Cody Merrow, Georgia, is taking over. Who am I talking about, kid? I believe you're speaking of Movzar Evloev. All right, let's hear him say it, shall we? 
Mousar okay. Yevloyev. Mousar Yevloyev. And then one more time. Mousar Yevloyev. Shout out to my man, John Gooden, trying to get uh, Yev Loyev to say it in a slower, more digestible way. To those that don't know, Ken Flo, what was your job? You language guy, speak six languages. What was your job before you got into fighting? Uh, well, I, I, I didn't speak that many languages, but I, I could read and understand and, and, and get by. But uh, I would translate or help get projects translated uh, in many different languages. So I was a pro, uh, pro uh, what do you call it? A project uh, manager for a lot of the financial documents that would get translated all over the world. Yeah. So this dude, right? Everybody thinks of me as the pronunciation guy, but Kenny was always my go-to for phonetics, for inflections, for all sorts of different things, not just for Brazilian Portuguese. And I love watching your reaction to some of these fighters say their names because that's tough, dude. I, see that one. I would not. And, and again, the other thing, which is a slight issue, uh, you know, if we're looking at nuance, is the way that they pronounce it and the audio. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's hard. Cody, I feel for you, man, on that Cody, one. I'm sorry. Cody, can we hear it once more, please? Oh, of course. Especially in my defense. Okay. And then one more time. Mousar Yevloyev. Mousar. All right, so <clears throat> Mavsar Yevloyev, and we'll see if our great producers, Mike Ricci and Zach Candido, correct me on it. Shout out to Lappy, too, who's not working this weekend, but I voiced this yesterday. Coming up next, Nate the Train Landwehr squares off against Mavsar Yevloyev. I went Yevloyev. And then we got another Roman Delidze. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Sumu Darji. This is why the fans tune into this podcast. This this, it looks clean on Bronco. You don't know the work. You don't know the reps that go into this. This is where you get the behind the scenes. Exactly. Well, hey, that's what I always say is that if I have said a name a hundred times by the time I show up to the arena, I shouldn't need phonetics. All right. Winding down the 2020 main event challenge. Let's make some picks, boys. It's the main event challenge. And the time is most definitely now. I finished fights! I'm gonna do everything possible to win! The main event challenge. The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. All right, today's main event challenge is brought to you by OddsShark.com. OddsShark is your source for the latest odds from leading authorities, expert editorial content, and detailed matchup picks with expert in-depth analysis for each game. Their free statistics, numbers, and trends will help you make the sharp picks on game day. Head over to OddsShark and start playing like a shark today. That's OddsShark.com. Don't forget the second S. All right, we now welcome in the Ducky and Parker. And Team Anna continues with its lead. It's now 155 to 141. You both hit on Miguel Baeza. You both had Devin Clark by decision. And we spin it forward to UFC Fight Night Hermanson versus Vittori as the main events just continue to crumble. First pick for us of a five-pack, I believe, today is going to be at flyweight, guys. Tyler Santos minus 210. Montana De La Rosa plus 175. Santos, Ian, I thought was on fire against Molly McCann. I think that was on Fight Island, and now she draws the plus grappler, Montana De La Rosa, who will be trying to avoid a third loss in her last four. Interesting stylistic clash here. Santos and De La Rosa get a start at IP. Who do you like, my man? <clears throat> yeah, you know, Santos, uh, no, no planes all morning, and then I go to ha! talk, and the fucking right. thing flies over my head. I swear, they're not on the right schedule here. I apologize. Uh, that was for dramatic effect. That's actually you know, Ian's private jet flying into the Boca Raton Municipal Airport, probably. To- totally. Why am I not on it then? Uh, <laughs> someone's just taking it for a spin. Yeah, yeah you, know you charter that shit out. We understand, you know? <laughs> totally. Yeah, that's how you think John's been getting back and forth to Fight Island and back to his home for the podcast. I know. I've so had to go to Abu Dhabi three times, and you could fit my house into your Parkland Palace. But Get as you were. Get the fuck out of here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even make it one comment without cursing. I'm sorry. I'm trying not to. Um, Who told you to curse less on the podcast? You know what? It's funny. On the YouTube comments, someone said – someone made a comment one time that I thought it was funny. They said when I curse, 
They say when you curse, it feels so weird because you're so professional on pay-per-views. When I curse, it sounds like a 10-year-old just went to Jewish sleepaway camp and learned how to curse for the first time and just can't yeah. stop doing it. Right. They're not wrong. It is kind of funny. That's funny. It's just, it's just uh, but then Gary V is like, no, be who you are. So I'm just trying to well, be right. a fucking duck, right? So If they heard you and me talk privately, it is very foul, the language. Uh well, we got to fucking move on, Ian. I mean, we yeah, need to we know sorry, uh, out of respect yeah. to Tyler Santos and Montana you're, De La Rosa. You're, which you're way good. I, yeah, I, you know, this is a hard one for me because Santos, you know, looked not great against um, Maria and then looked excellent against Montana. Right. And I think Montana De La Rosa has been someone that's been constantly improving, just having difficult matchups. I think her jujitsu is better, but I'm going to go based on the last performance and I'll go Santos here. Not comfortably. It's not someone I would bet on in this situation. I just think that things finally came together to what we thought that would be the case. So I'm going to go Santos. Canflo Montana De La Rosa is plus 175 here. Any value on that side or, or are you going with Tyler Santos? I, I think there is some value. Uh, I think um, I, I'm going to go with Santos for many of the same reasons that Ian already highlighted. I, I just think that it seems like she's getting it together. I could potentially see Rosa, uh, you know, uh, grinding it out uh, and getting the win, but uh, I'm going to go with Santos here. All right, co-main event, at least as it now stands, six days out, is a light heavyweight fight between the undefeated Jamal Hill, minus 170, taking on the old reliable Ovin St. Pru, who is plus 150. It seems crazy to call him old reliable, but he's only been in the UFC since April of 2013, seven and a half years, and this will be his 23rd UFC fight. Ian OSP has fought everybody trying to bounce Jamal Hill from the ranks of the unbeaten here. What do you think about the co-main? Yeah, I'm surprised OSP is taking another fight like this against a prospect. And I think this one's way more dangerous this time around. I like what I've seen out of Jamal Hill. I, I do think he is someone that could go decently far in this division. And with OSP, it just, you just don't know who you're going to get. You know, you really don't know if you're going to see that rangy athlete that knows to take the fight to the ground, or is it that I hate to say ego veteran that doesn't mind, you know, slanging and banging to prove a point. I think Hill is just going to be the faster, younger, hungrier guy here. And I like him in this fight. All right. You got a round and a method for me, brother. Oh, I can't believe this is the co-main event. Sorry. When I don't remember that, it's just, I don't expect it to be the uh, co-main event. My bad. I'm going to say, uh, this is not going all three rounds. There's no way I'm going to say second round TKO. Kempo, what do you have for me on the co-headlining fight this week? Listen, I think OSP could surprise us, right? Um, and I, I do think that his best bet is trying to get this fight to the ground uh, and, and try to look for a submission there. Um, I think that at this point in the game, I think Hill uh, is going to be faster. I think he's more precise as a striker. Um, but OSP can throw you off with how unorthodox he is. Am I willing to bet that at this point in the game, I can't because he just hasn't proven a level of consistency where I can say, oh, is going to get it done. So I, I, I'm going to go with Hill here. Knockout submission. I'm going to go with Hill by knockout. Let's go. Hill knockout round two. All right. And then we get to the main event before a couple of quick picks on the way out. We will have Ken Flo lead here on the main event. Kevin Holland out, Marvin Vittori in. We don't have a betting line as yet. Cody, you can track one, but earlier this morning, I couldn't find one on Jack Hermanson and Marvin Vittori. I had Hermanson as the favorite, Vittori as the dog. We will need the round and the method of victory. So here's Marvin Vittori. I really like this kid, Kenny. 27 years old, physical guy. He's won three in a row. As many of you know, the only man to beat him since 2016 Israel Adesanya, it was via split decision. He's never been finished. And then on the other side, you have Jack Hermanson. There's video of him getting the news that another opponent had fallen out. It was going to be Darren Till, then Kevin Holland. And I guess in this climate, Kenny, you just got to be prepared for anything. Jack Hermanson accepted this challenge willingly. And uh, he's won five of six big submission of Kelvin Gastelum with that heel hook in Abu Dhabi in July. Your thoughts on Hermanson against this new opponent, Vittori, and ultimately who wins it? 
That's right. Well, listen, I think Vittori needs to be very careful in this fight. I think that uh, Vittori overall can be a problem for a lot of guys. I think he's big. He's strong. Uh, he's tough. He's not going to go away easy. Uh, but there are times where I think he does get emotional and makes poor decisions during the fight. Still able to pull off wins in the times that he has done that. But I don't think that's the kind of guy that you want to do that against in Jack Hermanson. I think Hermanson is very dangerous. I think that he has the striking skill where he can stay on the feet and maybe uh, win all five rounds here. But uh, I do see Hermanson winning this fight by submission relatively early. Uh, let's go with Hermanson round two as well by submission. Can flow convicted on the Jack Hermanson side. Ian, what do you think about the main event? I'm opposite here, Senor Florian. I am opposite on this one. I think that you know, the changing of opponents here, I think, may throw Jack off a little bit. I think someone in Martin Vittori is somebody that can fight higher up based on the style. Listen, he is extremely physical. I think he's a smart fighter. His hands are catching up to his wrestling. And I don't, you know, the thing with Jack is this. I, he's very herky-jerky with his striking. His moves are a little, he's like very tight, but he moves very fidgety and you can see against someone in Jared Canyon when he fought, he was leading the dance doing pretty well until he got caught. I think if, if Jack doesn't keep this on the ground in his favor, I think he loses. You know, I don't, against Gaslam, you know, we, we haven't seen Kelvin Gaslam be himself in a while. You know, that did not seem like the Kelvin we've all seen that was a warrior against Israel Adesanya. It seems like Jack fights these guys when they're on the decline as opposed to when they're at their peak. So it's hard for me to really gauge. And then when Jack had an opportunity to be that dominant favorite against Ken here, it, it just, it slipped through his fingers, right? I think Vittori matches up pretty well. I think if it stands on the feet, it actually favors Vittori tremendously. I think his left hand is going to be a factor. And I don't think Vittori goes down so easily. And I, I don't see him being submitted. Although if Jack is going to win, I see why you chose that. I think Martin Vittori is going to grind this out and win by decision. All right, so it looks as though some early numbers might have Vittori as a slight favorite, minus 120, Jack Hermanson at even money. But again, Whoa. that is not the official line for the program today. So we will continue this conversation off the air. Um, but I will proceed as if Hermanson is a slight favorite. And you guys can certainly adjust your picks accordingly. Ian, that I mean, does sense. that change your stance if, uh, if, if you're not getting underdog points for Vittori or you still like Marvin? No, I, I still like him. That throws me off a little bit because I don't know how you don't make Jack the favorite, even based off of his last loss, based on level of competition. How, yeah, exactly. His activity, to me, that's a little bizarre. It's almost like an NFL trap thing. Maybe it's bad information. You know? Maybe it's yeah, bad he's information. He's fought way no, you, better competition than yeah, Vittori at this I point. Mean, yeah, with, with, without, it, without a doubt, way you're talking about Jared Kanyar and Kelvin Gaston compared to Carl Roberson. <laughs> right. That's, a, right. that's quite a spread. Vittori right has okay. fought the champ, though. Let's get a couple quick picks on the way out. Ian, light heavyweight, second UFC appearance for both Georgia's Roman or Roman Dolidze and Brazil's John Allen. Allen, the plus 135 underdog, Dolidze, minus 155, the favorite. Who do you like there, Ian? Although Allen was impressive as an underdog, I don't think anyone saw that coming. Uh, Dolidze, is that how you pronounce uh, his name? Uh, he was just so aggressive. He was so on point with his striking. I'm going to yeah. go his way. Can't he really good. Roman Dolidze or John Allen for you? <laughs> I think Ken flows on mute. Did he answer that question? Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm going to go with Delizia as well, John. Sorry. All right. That's okay. And Ken flow, I will get your pick on John Vellante minus 220. Uh, Jake call your plus 180 at heavyweight. I like Vellante in this one. Ian, I know, you know, John Vellante. Well, Jake call, you used to fight at middleweight. A lot of UFC experience for John Vellante over under 17 UFC fights for John Vellante. All right. Oh, you're asking me over under? Mm -hmm. uh, no, he doesn't. does he have that many fights in the UFC? Over under 17. Oh, sure, over. Under. He's got 16. This will be number 17 this weekend. Do you like Volante against Jake Collier? I think I have to. I mean, listen, he. I'm looking at Kenny. We're both looking at each other. This is these two guys, what the, what they look like right now. This is like totally 2020. Well, we don't know what they're going to look like this week with respect to the way they looked in their last. Yes. Yeah, yes, we absolutely do. If they're both fighting, <laughs> anyway, we absolutely know. We are giving these guys the opportunity to be them fat selves right now and enjoy being fat and fight someone who is equally as badly out of shape. And 
I just think I think Volante just fights better fat than Collier than, than right, Jake does. I re- I really do. I yeah. love John Volante. Yeah. It kills me seeing him like this. But hey, right. what the fuck, right? Well, yeah, I, I love how you switched it up to Jake after you butchered Collier. Collier's a tough one for you, huh? Collier, no, you know what? I'm just I, I'm this mat. I mean, no, it's not. But thank you. Um, I think you need to eat something. You've lost too much weight. I think I've lost too. I lost too much weight. They've gained too much weight. And I think I keep envisioning their two bellies smacking in the clinch and it's yeah. really throwing off my brain in general. All and right. It's well, going to be, uh, uh, yeah. Hey, get back <laughs> to the child care. By the way, we did some fishing in the backyard yesterday. We caught 10 ah. fish yesterday in my backyard. Did you throw them back? Yeah. The only thing that's hard for me. And I think a lot of our listeners probably were like, yeah, I knew Anik was a fucking pussy, but I don't like grabbing the fish and taking the hook out of the fish's mouth. You know, I don't like that part of it. So Give yourself- my daughter Riley caught this tilapia that was a bigger one than the previous one. And she's like, sorry, daddy, you know, cause dad's got to come over and wrestle with the fish. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, my soft side comes out while I'm wrestling, <laughs> trying to get the hook out of the mouth. I will tell you, uh, for those that don't know, in Florida, when you live in a community, you, you're supposed to throw it back. You probably don't even want to eat that shit. It's gross. Um, God only knows what people do <laughs> in that lake. I will tell you, though, and then I promise I'll get out of here. A few like a few months ago, especially in COVID, like people will fish. They'll even go in their boats and they'll fish. I saw this random like group of people, like four of them, a family. They were sitting um, literally right over here where the bank of the water is by my lake. And they had a cooler and they were fishing. And every time they caught one, they threw it in the cooler. And I was like, yo, I was like, what are you doing? And they go, we, we caught a fish. I go, yeah. He goes, what do you mean? Don't you cook them? I go, do you live here? He's like, no, we're visiting. I was like, dude, my son took a piss in that like three hours ago. I promise you don't want to eat that. Good for now, you. I, yeah. I mean, I was lying, although it may be true. I just don't know if it happened right. this week that he pissed in the lake, but Man, it's crazy that someone would even think like if I even turn the camera, the lake's supposed to be clear. It is like diarrhea green. You don't eat out of that. That's just it's and it's like that's Lake Parker. Get off Lake Parker. What you don't listen <laughs> yeah. to the, you don't listen to the Anakin you don't, you don't, podcast. You don't see the fucking sign. Yeah. You know, uh, John, let me ask you a question real quick. Does Junior Dos Santos? Did you say his kid goes to your kid's school? Because I saw him in my community uh, two nights ago looking at holiday lights, and I drove by him. I was very nervous to say hi because I always pick against him. So I waited till I went by one. Junior, he honked this one. I go, you're a legend. And then I sped off because if he even noticed me the slightest bit, he's, he's not going to be happy knowing that I'm picking against him again in a couple of months. Yeah, so. it was actually, uh, well, there you go. It was Andre Arlovsky. Andre Arlovsky. Went to the same that was what school you told as me. Mine. That's right. All right, at Ian Parker MMA, if you want more content from the duck, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. We'll get ready for the pay-per-view <laughs> coming up December 12th. Thanks, my man. You got it, guys. Take it easy. All right. That is it for the main event challenge. We have one final order of business with our pick to click NFL selections for Cody Merrow. I mean, man, I don't know what to say. The bad beats keep on coming. They couldn't get the Green Bay Packers home. You're three, seven and one. We'll say that again. Three, seven and one. I love you, though. Uh, And Team Anik is seven and five after a loser on the Jacksonville Jaguars. Who do you have for us here in week 12? My brother. Team Merrow is not discouraged. We're going to keep giving out picks no matter if they hit or not. So, John, unfortunately, I did have to cancel my own flights to Vegas. I was going to go out there That's for Aljo's right. title fight. Uh, you know, hopefully we're going to have some post fight drinks with Ray and celebration. But alas, we're going to have to wait till 2021. But maybe it's going to be all for the better. I am not, however, flying with the Falcons at home today because, John, I think Vegas is a sleeper team in the AFC. They're seven and three against the spread this year. But moreover, wow. they're four and one on the road against the spread. Not that anyone wants the bonus play out of me, but I think we're going to see a lot of points in this one. So on top of Raiders minus three, I also think we're going to see more than 53 points. Both teams let over 27 and a half points up every game. 27 and a half times two is 55. Two points over 53. I think you got some good value there. All right. So Cody Merrow undeterred as he gives you another selection, actually two today. He likes the Raiders minus three on the road in the ATL against the Falcons. And I will give you the Arizona Cardinals minus one at Gillette stadium against the Northern Raider. Patriots. I know I always say you can do better than fading Belichick in that building in Foxborough, Massachusetts, but I didn't love the Cardinals minus two and a half. Now it's one. You're asking me who's going to win that football game. I just think Arizona has more ways to win offensively. Uh, they just have a lot more than the Patriots do right now. I just have a love the way Cam Newton has thrown the football 
even though I love him as a player and as a human being, just don't like the way the ball's coming out of his hands. I don't know if it's COVID or what, but uh, give me the Cardinals short price at the New England Patriots today. That is my pick to click for week 12, and we got to get on out of here. Thanks to Longo, Cody at the controls. Thanks to Ian Parker. We are back with you next Sunday night. We'll recap Hermanson and Vittori and, of course, get you the preview for UFC 256 and the pay-per-view headliner between Davison Figueredo and Brandon Moreno. With that, thank you all for listening, for watching, for subscribing. Tell your buddy. For Ken Flo, I'm John Anik. We will talk to you next Sunday. Until then, don't text and drive. Yo, later.